We'll hear argument next in Case 12-1497, Kellogg Brown and Root Services versus United States ex rel Benjamin Carter. Mr. Elwood. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, by clearing the way for Relator to file a fifth identical False Claims Act complaint against KBR, raising allegations the government had long known from other sources, the Court below erred in two respects. First, the plain text and, la- and history of the Wartime Suspension of Limitations Act confirmed that it applies exclusively to crimes. The language of the provision uh, tolls limitations, peri- limitations periods for offenses. At the, on the very day that that provision went into effect, a neighboring provision, a nearby provision of Title 18, divided offenses into two categories, felonies and misdemeanors, both plainly applying to crimes. A neighboring provision, uh, also of Title 18, divided the offenses between capital offenses and non-capital offenses, again uh, referring solely to crimes. And it is very telling that in 857 dual-column pages of Title 18, neither the government nor relator has been able to identify any provision that uses the word offense to refer to a civil violation. Is it unusual that a criminal statute of limitations would be much longer than a civil Statute of limitations, which is the effect of, of your argument. I, I don't think it is necessarily. I mean, it depends on what exactly uh, Congress is trying to attempt, and it, it, it reflects some of the differences between the, how criminal laws prosecuted and civil laws prosecuted. Because recall um, that uh, Congress did; it has its separate provision for uh, recognizing that the False Claims Act may be hard to investigate at times, and it provided a discovery mechanism there that doesn't apply to relators. It only applies to the government. In a three-year discovery period with a 10-year backstop. And it, some states used to have uh, uh, no statute for, for murder and yet had a, a statute of limitations on uh, wrongful death wrongful claims. Death. I think that's, that's the mm-hmm. case, with respect to state law anyway. Um, but uh, I think it all kind of reflects the kind of differences between criminal law and civil law, because uh, the minute a complaint is filed, I mean, most of the inv- investigation, especially for relators, they don't have any legal status to conduct investigations. They, don't, they can't bring subpoenas. So usually it's based on their own knowledge. They file a complaint, they come into court, and then they have the federal rules. Also at that point, uh, the government gets a 60-day period to investigate, which uh, is on average 13 months, uh, according to the Chamber of Commerce uh, brief that cites a letter f- uh, from the DOJ to the Senate. And in our own experience, and in this case, is usually a couple of years. And during that time, they have, you know, all the time they want to investigate. So I think the, it just reflects the fact that criminal litigation and civil litigation are conducted differently. But clearly, Congress already contemplated how to handle delays under the False Claims Act, and they enacted a civil provision for that under the FCA. And so I don't think the Court needs to import and uh, this general provision, which applies only to offenses, to uh, address the False Claims Act situation that Congress has already specifically addressed. Now, all parties agree that the Wartime Suspension Act began its life as a criminal provision and exclusively an explicitly criminal provision. The only question is whether Congress changed it along the way to make it civil. Uh, the thing that the relators point to is the deletion in 1944 of the words, now indictable. But that went unremarked in Congress, and you would expect somebody to say something if they were fundamentally transforming the nature of the statute. And that's not what people understood those words now indictable to mean at that time. Uh, if you look at um, uh, if you look at the other things that were around it at the time, like, for example, 47 days after the first Wartime Suspension Act was enacted, Congress, uh, for crimes, and all agree it was for crimes, they also enacted an antitrust suspension act, which didn't use the word offenses, it used the word violations. And it said, now indictable or subject to civil proceedings, um, which shows that what was going on in that clause was about the now. Uh, the, it was to tell you that it, it applies to things that came before this. Are and you adopting the ar- argument of the New England Foundation? The amici brief? Uh, that is, yes, we, we made that argument, I think, uh, in our brief as well, but I think that they did a more full-throated version, and also NDIA did a more full-throated version of that. But, yes, I think that it was uh, the, the purpose of that was to say it was applied to things before the date of enactment and hadn't yet been barred. And that was one of the other things. I mean, if you look at what this Court said about that language in McIlvain, it said that that was to, uh, to say that the limit, statute of limitations hadn't run, that that's what that now indictable language did. Ma- this Court's McIlvain opinion. Mr. Elwood, well, I take the point, and that seems like a, 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 a fair understanding of why that 
term came out. But it wasn't the only change that they made at that point. And, and taking that term out may have had more than one reason, of course. So two other changes they make are they put in the word any. So the old statute just says offense, and now it's any offense, which suggests breadth and expansiveness. And the other thing, of course, is that they do all of this in connection with this Contract Settlement Act, which presumably refers both to civil and to criminal matters. And uh, it follows right after this uh, Contract Settlement Act and suggests that it's following on it. So, you know, put all those three things together, the taking out of the indictment language, the putting in the word any, and the passage in, in, in conjunction with the Contract Settlement Act, I think that that would be an argument sure. on the other sure. side. Sure. I'll try to address each of those. I have a pretty terrible memory, so just bring me back to it if I forget. I think now indictable is just to make it forward-facing, because they were now not worrying about just those cases. They wanted to make it forward-looking for the rest of the war. Um, with respect to any offenses, it wasn't just any offenses simpliciter. It was any offenses against the laws of the United States. And Congress meant, thought that was so unequivocally applied to criminal law that that is the exact phrase they used uh, in enacting the, the statute giving district courts exclusive jurisdiction over crimes. They didn't say crimes. They said offenses against the laws of the United States in 1948. Um, and what was the third time? I told you it was a terrible memory. Pardon me? Contract settlement. Oh, in the Contract Settlement Act. I mean, they say it was, a, you know, predominantly a civil statute, and they did create a big administrative state or an, an administrative apparatus. But the provisions that they, the causes of action they uh, created are actually, uh, uh, the, the primary ones it created were not actually subject to a statute of limitations, so it would have been curious to try to toll them. For example, the thing that, and this Court said in Kohler that 26B1 of the, of the Surplus Property Act wasn't subject to any statute of limitations. Uh, there was an anal- analogous provision in that 19C, which is the one that Relator and the government both pick out and say, aha, look at this, a new civil cause of action. They were probably trying to toll that. But as the Solicitor General said in footnote 3 of their Kohler brief to this Court, the remedy in that is substantially like the remedy in 20B, uh, 26B1 with the suggestion being that it was not itself subject to a statute of limitations, which is what the district courts that have addressed uh, 19C have said, that it wasn't subject to a statute of limitations. As the SG's brief points out, the Court of Claims applied a statute of limitations to both 26B1, which this Court overruled, and to 19C. Uh, but I think that the district courts had a better — had the better of that argument. But the overall impression is it was still, at the end of the day, it was still applying to offenses, that is, crimes. And that goes for the government as I mean, suppose the government, not a relator, brings a false claims uh, case against a contractor. The government wouldn't get the the under your view, the government doesn't get the the suspension. That's right. It doesn't get the wartime suspension. It would, however, get the specific three year tolling provision or three year discovery period. Uh, under the uh, False Claims Act itself. Um, and I, a couple other notes that I think are not worth, worthwhile. We, we've already said a lot about the fact that the Solicitor General said in 1959 at a time when it had been litigating these cases continuously that it was subject to criminal laws only. But I think it's also significant that the officer created by the Contract Settlement Act uh, or the Office of Contract Settlements said in 1947 that this tolling provision only applied to crimes. And I think that's significant because, I mean, it was within, I'm not saying it's a Chevron deference thing, but it was within their duty, as the government points out, they had to investigate and report it to uh, the government to do what they will with it. Uh, but the end result of it was that you have to know whether that's subject to tolling or not when you're deciding how to prioritize what you're going to be investigating and reporting. Um, I think one final thing, and then I'll move on to the other uh, element or the other error that the Court made, was that um, neighboring provisions in Title 18 simply wouldn't make sense if offense also applied to violations of the civil laws. Like, for example, 3282A, it says, no person may be tried for an offense unless indicted within five years of when the offense arose. And obviously, you can be tried for a civil crime without being indicted within five years. And under Cowart versus Nichols, uh, that is, you know, something the Court takes into consideration in trying to determine the meaning of something. 
Now, uh, even though it would be mostly a complete remedy if we won on the wartime suspension grounds, if the Court also gets to the first-to-file issue, it could save the — Can we in any way? Assuming we agree with you yeah, on the first question. Yeah, assuming you agree question. with me on the um, first question. Should we uh, — A, should we get to the second, and how would we if, if we believe — if you were right on the first. Well, uh, I, you should because, among other things, it will take care of on remand. The Court won't have to address uh, the equitable tolling argument that we think is waived and also meritless. Um, and also, of course, there is the same issue already behind this in the Purdue Pharma case and uh, in the Shea case as well. And so I think the Court may as well. Uh, it would be the most efficient thing to do. Um, but I, I think it will be it would be a complete remedy uh, on us if we won on the wartime suspension grounds. Now, the second error that the court below made was to uh, well, if Congress had meant the first to file bar to be a one case at a time rule, allowing a, a you know an unending or infinite series of related lawsuits, it would have said so in plain terms. The, the only pro- the problem you have with this argument, and it has substantial force to it, but that you give. Uh, no significance of the word pending. Uh, you almost write that out of the statute. I, I, I don't. I disagree, Justice Kennedy, because I mean you have to have some sort of word there, uh, because otherwise it would be kind of confusing between the two uh, between the two actions. Hey, how about I mean, former? Well, there are a lot of ways. Pending is a very strange former. word to pick. Or first. But, but the thing is, well, let me begin by saying that or, under or said action or that action. Yeah, but I, I, I think under each of the parties here, it could have been written better to follow up, you know, what, to, to embody uh, the reading that we want to give it. But I think that ours is the one that makes the most sense, because if you just look at the provision from the moment when the bar arises, it makes perfect sense. It is the pending action at that point. And well, but it, aren't you to, under, besides the problem that you're, you're talking of, you're not giving pending any meaning, you're also destroying the force of an original source. I mean, the the uh, public disclosure bar doesn't apply to an original source, and you're sort of blocking original sources from bringing suits when a dis- prior case involved a dismissal for a technicality or a dismissal because this was in the public domain. But that's not true for an original right. source. But I, I think – to begin with, there's nothing in the public disclosure bar that suggests that it was supposed to prevent the original source from being subject to all of the other bars that are out, st- out there still, like the, you know, like the government knowledge bar that still exists in a tiny little corner, uh, or the first to file bar. And the original source makes a lot of sense for public disclosure, but it doesn't make any sense for first to file for this reason. When it's public disclosure, when it's something that's said in a committee report, you have no idea whether or not it got into the ear of the person at the Justice Department who needs to, needs to know about it for something to be done about it. In first to file, however, they not only they have to file an action in district court, and they have to give all the material evidence they have to the Attorney General of the United States, who is under a statutory obligation to investigate it, and who has to decide whether to intervene or not. Now, that is something that guarantees that you know, by hook or by crook, somebody at Justice Department with responsibility for these things knows it and has the information that they need to take action on this. And after you've done that once, it doesn't make a lot of sense for you to be able to just keep coming into court and filing a lawsuit telling the government, hey, you know that stuff that you already know? Let me tell it to you again. Well, I want the reality to you is you it. don't need a quitan unless the government doesn't want to waste resources on something. But that doesn't mean that they didn't. Uh, find that there might be something there. But uh, the, once the, I mean, once the government has, once the original first to file bar, uh, once the original relator reports this information to the government, if the other actions that are to be barred are related, the government has the information it needs to investigate all of them. But what this. But it does, may not want to prosecute it. It may, I mean, well, I, it may I, decide that you, there's. You have to assume. That what the intent is, is not to force the government to prosecute, but to get recovery for the, for, for the government. I think it is the, the point of the first file bar is to do two things, and this is kind of widely accepted. That first, it is to give incentives for people to come forward. And I think that basically requiring it to stop at one is a, is a much more powerful incentive to come forward promptly with the information you have. And secondly, it is to make sure that the government 
doesn't dilute its recoveries by paying subsequent relators for information the government already has. And if the first relator gave you enough information to investigate the whole breadth of the crime, you won't have to pay that initial relator there, you know, depending on whether, I guess, you, if you intervene by presumption, it would be 15 to 25 percent. But if that person can file and the next person can file and the next person can file, as long as there's a break in the traffic. Do you have any idea how collateral estoppel works in this area? I, I actually don't know, but um, let's assume that, you, you're, that the adversary won a claim against you. Could someone else come in and um, — You've now won for the government, essentially. Could anyone else file a suit, or would they be stopped because? Well, at, at that point, it would be already — I mean, I guess it would depend on the scope and how related — you're talking about KBR lost in this hypothetical, correct? Exactly. Because they're the mutuality. I mean, it gives more uh, — you know, because there had already been a finding that KBR had done certain things, that might apply to other relators. But I think the thing that kind of matters more is, what about the non-mutuality in the other direction? Because if KBR beats Relator number one and they say there was no problem here, what about Relator two through X? The Relator is treated as the government for, for preclusion purposes. Well, I mean, that was at least, at least so judge. I don't, I don't think that it's clear that that's the case. Uh, well, there, although there is, there is good authority, at least in the Court of Appeals. That position. I disagree, Justice Ginsburg. Uh, we've, we've been looking for it, and we have not found anything that clearly says Relator 2 is bound by Relator 1 uh, having lost in an action. There is the, the, the language, which I think is dicta in Eisen, Eisenstein, to say that the United States itself is barred. But uh, I think that any, any defendant is going to have to establish that law anew if it's going to apply to further relators down the road. But, but is, it your, your, is it your position, a suit number one is filed, it's dismissed uh, within weeks uh, without prejudice? Uh, uh, no other relator can file? It depends on what the basis of the dismissal was, because if it was dismissed on 9B grounds, routinely uh, they can amend. And it's not dismissing the whole action. It's just dismissing that complaint, and they, they can come right back in with an amended complaint. Question and that is, is the same action. somebody else could jump in. So you have somebody who co- who is the first buyer and comes in with a sloppy complaint, and it's not uh, as stated with sufficient specificity, dismissed, and that person goes away. You're saying nobody else can ever. No, I think it's the protection there comes from the word related, because courts of appeals apply a same material facts test. If you come in with a sloppy mess of a complaint that doesn't allege it, just says KBR is bad. Well, it was a perfect perfect complaint, but he sued in the wrong court, or there was no personal jurisdiction. Well, dismissed without dismissed without prejudice. I mean, if it's if it's in the wrong jurisdiction, you can transfer it. I mean, that's a very hard thing to say. No, the hypothetical is process. dismissed without prejudice, but it's a beautifully drawn complaint. Well, I'm going to resist. The, I'm going to resist uh, for a little while before we get to the to the meat of the issue, just to say that it's not going to happen because personal jurisdiction has nationwide service of process, and so it's very hard to uh, invoke a personal. It's jurisdiction. dismissed for failure to prosecute. Well, if it's a non-merits ground, and, and so nobody else can, yeah. uh, can If it's it? dismissed for failure to prosecute, well, first of all, uh, let me resist the hypothetical a little bit more. If it's under our rule, that's an incredibly valuable lawsuit because there are no more mulligans. And so there will be somebody who comes in there and is willing to underwrite it, a new law- set of lawyers who will be willing to take the case. But if it is, I think that we would say it has been barred. If somebody came forward and provided all material information, then everything that is related to that would be barred. I'd like to get back to Justice Ginsburg's hypothetical because it's an important one. And that is, if somebody files, the relator says, oh, well, somebody files a terrible complaint, it's going to bar all the good ones. And I don't think that's the case because they're going to compare under that test, the uh, the same material facts Mm -hmm. test, you compare. And if this one just says KBR is bad, they commit a lot of fraud, and this one says that these three camps, they were requiring people to bill 12 hours a day, 84 hours a week, regardless of how much they, they worked, those aren't the same material facts. And you get the protection that way. I thought the first filer rule was meant to protect the first filer in that, well, one aspect of it is the first filer doesn't have to worry about a race to judgment. Somebody else files second and gets the judgment first. So I thought that that, that was one of the chief aims was to protect the first filer and also to protect that Father's recovery 
so he doesn't have to split up whatever the key term plaintiff. The phrase race to judgment is not anything that I have found in the courts of appeals. I've only found it in the government's brief. I think that uh, the court says that the incent- they want to create the first to file bar was meant to create a race to the courthouse, not a race to judgment. And um, uh, what so the first file is a race to the courthouse. Yes, it's meant to create a race to the courthouse. And there's less of an incentive to race to the courthouse under the relator's rule because even if you aren't the first to file, you can still bring a claim. You just got to wait for a break in the traffic to jump in. And uh, I mean, I'm under that. You, if you are the first to file, you don't even get a better settlement because when, you know, most of these cases are settled, they aren't litigated to judgment. And a defendant is not going to give you, you know, everything you're asking for if they know that they're going to have to settle this case again and again and again. And, in fact, it discourages settlements because you would be a fool to settle it right away because it just means more people are going to be able to sue you. The, the relator's rule is a, as many lawsuits as you can fit into six years or ten years or an infinite period of time because, you know, there, there's nothing particular to stop them. Whereas under our rule, you have much more of an incentive to settle and settle for the full amount because by settling with that first relator, you are buying peace with respect to all related lawsuits. Do we know in this case there were, there were three suits? Thorpe, I think, was the first. Do we know why those suits dropped out? The first one was just dismissed. The lawyers dropped out, um, and they couldn't or they didn't find other lawyers. The first card. Thorpe. The first Carter suit. Uh, no, I'm sorry. The first Thorpe lawsuit. The first the related Thorpe. lawsuits uh, was just fe- dropped for failure to prosecute when uh, lawyers, new lawyers, didn't take, step in to take so over for the case. Right, right, right. That they made the full disclosure. The government investigated that case, and they knew the 12-hour a day, 84-hour uh, a week uh, claim, and they were able to investigate it. And if they wanted to bring it, they could have brought it and recovered the whole thing, and only paid the Thorpe relators. And I don't know why the uh, other ones uh, dropped out, they, but they were voluntarily dismissed, I believe, all of them. And as I said, uh, I think this is the more natural. Pardon me? Were any of them filed by original sources? I think, uh, I think all of them were original sources. They were all people who would have qualified as original sources. And. Um, under the under the statute, and as I say, I think that this is the more reasonable reading of it because if you look at this from the point of view of when the bar arises, when it is the pending action, uh, it does everything. No word of surplusage, everything fits. But I have yet to see a one case at a time rule that works the way the, the, this statute does. That uses just an adjective. Uh, which I mean, if you look at it, it's an adjective that is only describing what is a related case. And but, usually but it's, it's not a, a pending action later. I mean, when that action's been dismissed or been completed, you say that a later action is prohibited even though there is no pending action, right? But that's, that's because I think that if you, as I say, if you look at this from the point of view of when the action is filed, it makes complete sense, and it is a pending action. And I, there's a reason for doing that. If you look at pages 8A to 9A, uh, this is the mirror image. The language used in B5 is the mirror image of the language used to create the cause of action in B1. It says in B1, a person may bring a civil action for a violation of Section 3729. And then you find out what happens when they do that, and the bar arises. Five, when a person brings an action under the subsection for that violation of 3729, no person other than the government may bring a related action. So it's a, it's a parallelism between a person may bring and no person may bring, which suggests that you look at it then going forward. And looking forward indefinitely, just as B1, you look forward for six years or ten years, or if there's no statute of limitations, forever. Mm-hmm. And by the same token, I think five is a looking forward provision, that the bar arises and that's it, no person may bring. And when you contrast that to saying that this is a temporal limitation, you, I, you know, I, def, I defy you to find another provision that uses just the word pending with no verb, no nothing, to give it some sort of effect like that. You know, we cite a couple of, of — Since you're getting into that again, I mean, to me it makes perfect sense to apply it thus to the pending action. The action goes away. Number two person, and that means there isn't going to be the problem that Justice Ginsburg suggested. So we don't have that problem. And now we have a new person who can bring a suit if and only if 
is the original source. Well, if he's the original source, let him recover. Why not? And your answer to that is, well, he didn't tell the government all the stuff the first guy did. Well, so, yeah, but that's not the only it's, purpose of free can action. It has other purposes. It's to reward the person who, in fact, did discover this thing and, and made every effort to bring it to public attention. But there's, there's nothing Why in not? the first-to-file bar that says anything about an original source. Original source is a carve-out for the public disclosure bar. I know, but he can't — but other, other things prevent him from bringing it unless he's the original source. Am I not right? No, I, I mean, it's all been disclosed, you know. Everything's been point. disclosed. Well, it may or may not have been, because what? frequently it may or may not have been, because somebody's taken on mind the run. Right, right. I, I don't want but to interrupt. In I don't want to interrupt your reserving your time. Okay. I would, I would like to reserve the remainder of my time for rebuttal, please. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Stone? Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, this civil FCA war fraud case is told under the plain language of the WSLA because it is, it is an offense involving fraud against the United States under subsection 1 and is also an offense committed in con connection with the payment or performance of a war contract under subsection 3. If we look at if we look at the text of the law which applies here, which is at our appendix at page 1, there is nothing in that text which limits, which limits offenses to criminal offenses. There's not a single word in that text. But it's based, oh, it's based in the criminal code. It's based in Title That's true. Uh, that's true, Justice Ginsburg. But as the government has identified, I believe it's in note 3 of their brief, there are at least seven civil offenses in the criminal code, including uh, RICO, civil RICO. And, in fact, I would, I would direct the Court to Section 1034, which says specifically, the Attorney General may bring a civil action in the appropriate United States District Court against any person who engages in conduct constituting an offense under Section 1033 upon proof of such conduct by preponderance of the evidence. That is a civil offense. That is not a criminal offense. And I believe if you look, uh, if the justices, if you look Is there at any civil offense in Title 18? Yes, I, ju I, just, I just listed one. That's in 18. That's Title 18, Section 1034. They're in, we've is that about fraud? That's about fraud, yes. And what is the word offense? Insurance. What does the word offense mean in that provision? The word offense is this court. In that provision, what, what is the, the word? The word offense means a transgression of law, which may be. It means a criminal be. offense, right? Uh, I disagree, Your Honor. I believe it wouldn't make any sense in Title 18 unless the offense they're referring to is one of one of the criminal offenses of Title 18. I don't agree, Justice Scalia, because. Read the provision again, would you? Certainly. The Attorney General may bring a civil action in the appropriate United States District Court against any person who engages in conduct constituting an offense under Section 1033 and upon proof of such conduct by a preponderance of the evidence. But 1030, that is a civil but 1030 provision. Right. 1033 is the way a number of the provisions in the Criminal Code are written. The offenses or the conduct which is punishable or in subsection I think I think the point that people are trying to make is right. perhaps is that that provision you read provides for a civil action by the attorney general right. against a person who has committed an offense what offense an offense elsewhere defined in 18 right. is that offense defined elsewhere criminal or civil it is criminal and I, that's, I that's the point, I think. And I disagree, Justice. Right, I know you disagree, <laughs> but uh, if, what, so if, let's turn to the if, other offense of cross-references. If we read, if we read, read the language that? carefully, which I have well, I got the language of that one. If we read but, the language of a number of the statutes, a number of the statutes in Title 18, they have punishments that are criminal. Everything in Title 18 has punishments that are criminal. There are a number of statutes within Title 18 that also have civil remedies or create civil private rights of action. Nobody believes by using the term offense that Congress intended to turn those into criminal statutes. That no, I, I agree with the word offense appears, and it provides for civil action. 
What I wonder is, when you turn to the particular provisions that do that and look at the word offense, is that word offense in those civil remedy provisions referring to a civil or criminal behavior? It is referring to, to civil, you say. So let's read it. conduct which can constitute a crime, which okay. is punishable by criminal punishment, but is also punishable by civil, mm-hmm. by civil remedies. And the right. offense yeah. refers to the civil behavior. Yes, because okay, there's Okay, good. Read me the example because I must have missed it. Because it says it must be proved by a preponderance of the evidence, which means it's not proved by, uh, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt, so it can't be a crime. It has to be a civil offense. M- and Mr. Schoen, that, that language appears in a number of places in, in Title 18. But it, can, may I? Mr. Schoen, don't, don't take this for more than it's worth, because I yeah. think there are plenty of arguments against you. But I'm, <laughs> I'm actually not sure I understand this one. I mean, it seems to me if your view is it applies to both criminal and civil offenses, right. well, Congress had to put the thing someplace. Exactly. It exactly. could have put it in the criminal code, or it exactly. could have put it with all the other civil provisions. And in fact, Either it, way, there would be kind of a mismatch. And presumably this started out as criminal, and it refers largely to criminal, right. and so that's where it goes. Right. And, and there's no dispute that there was a limitation in 1921 and in 1942 on the statute because it said now indictable. It said now indictable, so that it referred to criminal. Well, they took that limitation out, as I believe one of the justices made the point earlier. Not only did they take out that limitation, so there's no limitation on the word offense, they added the word any, which this Court has held in Gonzales, should be read broadly, any offense. And this Court has said both uh, in Moore, this Court said that an offense is, is an infraction of the law which may be punishable either civilly or criminally. And again, this Court said in National Gypsum that Congress knows the difference between the elements of a criminal offense and a civil offense. So obviously, what is your, what is your offense answer can be civil. It is a textually permissible reading of this text that offense can be civil. What is your answer to the argument that this would be a big change if it previously applied only to crimes and then, according to you, it was changed so that it applied to civil claims as well? That would be a big change. What is your response to the argument that we might find a little uh, — a a bit of evidence here or there that that's what was intended, but — Mr. Elwood says there's nothing. There's much evidence, uh, Justice Alito. First of all, this was historically, you have to look at when this statute was being passed. In, in 1942, they were concerned about, they were in the middle of a war that was consuming the entire nation. In 1944, they were concerned with wrapping up that war. They were passing Contract Settlement Act, primarily a civil act, this was passed, this amendment was passed as part of the Contract Settlements Act. They were passing the Surplus Property Act. How are we going to deal with all this property? They, they created civil offenses for surplus property. They did say this same Congress, the 1944 Congress, said in a report that this will allow, because the bulk of the offenses under this act will not be cognizable and investigated until after the war, this will allow for that for litigation to occur. So they use the term litigation, again suggesting that's not a term you normally use when you're talking about crimes. They use that term. Um, so, so they is, clearly — Is that your best evidence, that there was a reference to litigation? That's, that's the best reference because there's not — there's virtually — Where, where, where did that appear? That appeared in a Senate report okay. uh, when, they passed, oh, you know. when they passed the Surplus Property Act. But um, I, I think you need, to look, uh, you need to look at the historical uh, reference of when this was occurring. This was occurring when they were creating all these civil remedies. It made sense for them to expand. They added the word any to offense. They had no need to add the word any to offense. They did that because they wanted to make it clear that it could have covered any offense, including civil or criminal offenses, and they took out — And I agree there could be more than one reason why you take this language out. But they took out the now indictable language, which was the only limitation that could be read in the text that would limit it to crimes, and there's nothing in the text as it now occurs. I would also point out that the 2008 Congress, when they strengthened this, obviously believing that Wartime Suspensions Limitation Act should continue to be in force, mentioned twice uh, litigation. They, They mentioned the fact 
that the that, that this was in order to allow courts, prosecutors, and litigants to know when the statute. What, what was Congress was that? The 2008 Congress. And that's where does that appear? That appears in in a uh, Senate report as well. Two two Senate committees or just one Senate committee? Uh, one Senate committee report. One Senate committee. It's cited in and that's the Congress. Cited in our red brief. Yes, yes, Your Honor. Um, I would point out, though, that the meaning of offense in 1921 and the meaning of offense in 1942 was a transgression of law, as this Court said in Moore v. Illinois. It's a transgression of law which could be punished civilly. It could be punished criminally. We need more context. We need something in the statute to limit it. There's nothing in the statute. And it makes sense that Congress wouldn't have wanted to limit it because they would have wanted to give the government the option of pursuing a criminal well, I mean, all that's true, except right. when you're dealing with an old statute that used to be clearly criminal. And uh, it seems to me at that point the burden, when that statute is extended, the burden is on you to show that it's been changed from the criminal to the civil. Well, Judge, I would point out — To include the civil. And, uh, you know, that's a different burden from what you expect. Justice Scalia, I would point out that nine of ten courts that considered this in the aftermath of the 1944 amendment held that it did apply civilly, and five of those were false claims, civil false claims act cases. And those courts and that judicial precedent was in place for 40 years — Congress never changed that language, never went back. They could easily have written the word criminal in in 1944. They chose not to do that. Well, were they, and they could have written it were in. Were they district courts, four district courts? Is that it? They were, they were district courts. Yeah, did yeah. Congress know about those? Congress is presumed to know about them. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I would also point out that the people in the courts that were operating at the time that this amendment was made understood it to change the law. Nine of the ten courts understood it to change the law. So it goes to what people believed at the time the meaning of that word was. Because change the law to do what? To, to, to allow it so civil the statute offenses. would operate prospectively, not just to crimes that had already occurred. That, right. So that's one change that right. everybody agrees. Change the law to uh, include any offense we would say that was related to the war, which would include our civil FCA war fraud offense in this case. It's specifically consistent with Congress's intent that a, that a fraud such as occurred in this case, that the government would be able to pursue it. It's, it's a fraud on the troops in wartime. It's exactly why the statute was passed. It's exactly why the False Claims Act was passed. The government can pursue it in a criminal case. The question is whether right, and the civil and the question is whether it's appropriate, and, be, and based on the language, Justice Scalia, based on the language of this statute, which nowhere in it contains a limitation, the only limitation was taken out in 1944, and instead they added the word any, and they added two subsections that could the be read. The urged is the word offense. That's the limitation that is urged, which is normally used to connote a crime. Well, if the, the, the two and, I, and I don't think that changes the if, terms, you put, if you put the word any in front of it. But, Your Honor, in Moore versus Illinois, the Court said that offense means a transgression of law that could be punished either criminally or civilly. And presumably Congress was aware of this Court's holding in Moore, or is, is presumed to be. And then this Court, again, on a number of occasions, including in National Gypsum, referred to Congress as being familiar with the difference between criminal and civil offenses. There would be no need for the term civil offense, or the term criminal offense, if offense meant crime. Offense doesn't mean crime. There would be no need for the word criminal offense. If well, offense pro- what means problem crime. Is it? By the way, the word criminal offense occurs um, a number of times. Um, That's just Ginsburg. I'm sorry. Every, everyone agrees that from 1921 on, it was understood that this was a criminal statute. And I think the point has been made before. Mm-hmm. If Congress really was going to change it, to load it all onto the excision of two words which can be explained on other grounds, it's a bit much. Wouldn't Congress have said, now we're going to make it, it we want it to be civil, so we're going to make it clear that it's civil? Justice Ginsburg, I, I would point out a, a couple of things about that. First of all, the surplusage language which, um, which Petitioner points to, which they claim was the reason that this was taken out, 
was in the statute since 1921. So they have no historical reason why all of a sudden in 1944 it was taken out. It was there the exactly other reason the entire time. The statute acted retrospectively uh, for the first part of its history, and then it took it out when it was going to operate prospectively. But, uh, but um, Judge, Judge Ginsburg, that's not correct because the language at the end of the Wartime Suspension of Limitations Act holds that provides that, that the statute does apply retrospectively. It applies to any statute of limitation which has not yet run. And that's been in the statute since, ni- since 1942. Uh, I would also point out that the 1921 statute had nothing to do with the war. There's not much we can glean from the 1921 statute. All that it did was to increase the statute of limitations from three years to six years for fraud. It didn't mention the war at all. And in 1942, all that the statute did was extend until 1945 uh, the provision that was in uh, in 1942. It also did not refer to the war. So the first uh, statute that actually referred to the war was the 1944 statute. So, yes, it's true that some language was used. Um, but I, I believe, you know, as, as we set forth in our, our brief, that — Offense can mean criminal or civil. It's a textually permissible interpretation. There's nothing that limits it in the current law. It's consistent what Congress intended when they passed these statutes. And I urge the Court to seriously consider that, because it would be inappropriate for the government to be limited to pursuing cases only criminally against defendants who are war profiteers and not have that civil civil remedy. Um, if I may move on to the False Claims Act. Well, you can either reserve time or move on. It's up to you. I'd like to move on, if I may. If I Go ahead. May. Uh, the False Claims Act, as, as Justice Scalia pointed out, pending in the False Claims Act, it's, it's a word that was chosen in the uh, first-to-file provision. It's a word that Congress chose to use. It makes sense, because if you look at the statutory scheme in which that provision uh, is found. It's talking about while that action is pending, what the government can do. It talks about the previous provisions talk about the government making a decision about intervening. The next provision talks about the government can dismiss that case, which which protects all the concerns that that Mr. Elwood has pointed out, because the government has the ability to dismiss a case any time that it wants to, if it isn't in the interest of the government for that case to be there. So it also uses the term intervention. You cannot intervene in a non-pending case. Congress specifically chose to put these in the same sentence to say, no person shall intervene or file a related case while the case is pending. So for that reason, I believe pending is clearly the most reasonable interpretation, but it's also the most consistent with the statutory scheme, which, as uh, Justice Keegan pointed out, provides that original sources can go forward even if the government has knowledge of a fraud and even if the government is investigating that fraud, as this Court found in Graham County. What, and, happens, what happens if you have a first filer brings a claim, it's successful, either gets a judgment or gets a settlement, and the case is over, it's no longer pending? We, we would argue, and I believe the government will agree, that claim preclusion, race judicata, all the typical doctrines would apply. I would point the Court to Stevens, where the Court held that the relator was an assignee of the government. And if an assignee of the government brings a case and either settles it or it's decided on the merits, that would bar any future case. And I believe the government will agree with that. But to allow the defendants to say that a case that is brought that may never be pursued, like in this case, Thorpe, where they alleged everywhere in the world there was fraudulent billing, this person had never been to the base where the fraudulent billing was occurring in our case, had no personal knowledge of it. No relator, other relator, was found to be an original source. They didn't reach that issue. I'm not sure the government will agree with that, as, as, as you confidently predict, but I guess we'll ask the government. Right. Well, but that, I, that I, think it, I think that would be our position. You're, you're saying that if uh, — uh, somebody uh, brings a suit and is uh, um, it, it loses. The government is uh, is is thereby precluded from 
uh, joining a later suit, right? The government is. I, I am saying that if somebody brings a lawsuit yeah. and, and on the merits, there's a decision on the merits, right. the government has chosen not to intervene in that case. Right. They've had the opportunity to intervene at any point. But they point, didn't intervene. Then they are bound. And yes. Okay. Um, and furthermore, we'll see what the government thinks. <laughs> and furthermore, I just want I want to make the point that Congress, in in the False Claims Act, I've been doing this for a while, it, that Congress in, inextricably intertwined the government and and relators. You can't tear them apart because the whole point of the False Claims Act is to incentivize people with knowledge, with evidence, with witnesses to come forward. Because even if the government knows, and Congress understood this, even if the government has knowledge of a fraud, that doesn't mean they can prove the fraud. That doesn't mean that they're going to be able to find out about the fraud by investigating it. What helps them prove the fraud is somebody who has personal knowledge, an original source, who can testify. Here's the evidence. I saw this happen. And Congress knew that was very important, and that's why they created the original source provision and, and provided that original sources can pursue cases even if the government doesn't intervene. Because there may be cases where the government doesn't intervene for various reasons where it's valuable for those cases, for the taxpayers and for the government, for those cases to be pursued. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Thank you very much. Sorry for my confusion about the time reservation. Thank you. Why were you confused? Mr. Stewart? Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, when Congress enacted the 1942 version of the Wartime Suspension of Limitations Act, it was acting against the backdrop of this Court's 1921 decision in United States versus Hutto. And the Court in Hutto was construing the general federal criminal conspiracy statute. And that statute made it a crime, among other things, to conspire to commit an offense against the United States. And the question before the Court was whether that criminal statute covered conspiracies to commit civil violations. And the Court held that it did. The Court held that there was no necessity in the statute for the offense, the object of of which is the conspiracy, to be a criminal offense, and that the criminal statute could be violated by a conspiracy to commit a civil wrong. And there are certainly a great many provisions in Title 18 that use the word offense in which there are other contextual clues within the provision that make clear that only crimes are covered. Is there there a provision that uses the word offense, even though it may be civil, where that word offense in that provision refers to something other than a criminal offense? Not other than a criminal offense. As as Mr. Stone Every use of the word offense in Title 18 is in reference to a criminal offense. It it refers to conduct with criminal, that, to which criminal penalties attach. As Mr. Stone was explaining, there are provisions in Title 18 that use the word offense to describe conduct that is subject to both criminal and civil sanctions, and those are criminal but offenses. The answer to my question was yes. They are still crimes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay. But, but what we would say about 3287 is the word offense is being used something in the same way as a hybrid. There's no dispute that the current version of the WSLA does cover crimes. It tolls the limitations period for criminal prosecutions, but it also applies to civil offenses. The, the next thing I would ask the Court to look at is on page 1A of the government's brief, uh, we've reproduced the original 1942 version of the Wartime Suspension of Limitations Act. And the provision begins, the running of any existing statute of limitations applicable to offenses involving the defrauding or attempts to defraud the United States or any agency thereof, whether by a conspiracy or not, and in any manner, and now indictable under any existing statutes. And if you look even to the rest of that provision, the only clear evidence you would find that this version of the statute was limited to crimes was the phrase, now indictable. Now, it's possible that the phrase now indictable did other work as well, but it was the only language in the statute that limited the provision to crimes. And and so part part of the question by the Court, understandably, has been to the effect of if Congress meant to change this in 1944, why didn't it do something more direct to manifest that intent? And, And part of our point is, in some sense, removal of now indictable is indirect, but in some sense, removing the only language that previously limited the, the provision to crimes is the most way 
direct way to go about it. If the statute had well, originally Well, 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 you, you can say that it limited it, or you can say that it, it showed, it showed that the word offense in that statute was being used to mean a criminal offense. Right? I, I, I don't think it, it could. Uh, I acknowledge that sometimes uh, you can say offense and it means civil. Sometimes you can say that it means criminal. And sometimes you can say it means both. But what that language did in the original statute was to make it clear that the word offense in this statute was being used in a criminal sense. And I don't think that that implication is eliminated by simply taking out the, uh, taking out the now indictable language which could have been eliminated for a very different reason, and that is uh, to show that it, it, it operates prospectively. I, I guess p- part of the point I would make is if the initial version of the statute had referred to <coughs> existing stam- statutes of limitations on criminal offenses and Congress had then excised the word criminal, we would say I think that would be viewed as very powerful evidence that Congress intended an expansion. But there would be no other reason for eliminating the word criminal, whereas there is a very good other reason for eliminating the phrase now indictable. Well, the the reason that has been postulated is that now indictable uh, originally served the purpose of making clear that the WSLA would not revive expired prosecutions and that this was no longer necessary in 1944 because the statute was amended to to make that point clear separately. But, in fact, the 1942 version of the statute said, this act shall apply to acts, offenses, or transactions where the existing statute of limitations has not yet fully run, but it shall not apply to acts that would otherwise be, be barred. In Council, uh, yes. is the Korean War covered by the WSLA? I, I think the general understanding at that time was that only declared wars were covered, and so likely the Korean War would not have been covered. I, I don't know is that, that your, Is that your position now, that only declared wars, wars are covered? Well, the statute was amended in 2008, and it now provides, and the current version of the statute is at page 4A, uh, this is current 3287. It says, when the United States is at war or Congress has enacted a specific authorization for the use of the armed forces. Was, pursu- was there such an authorization in the Korean War? Not, not pursuant to. No, no, I mean at, right. at the time. I don't think there was. Right? I, I don't, I don't. I'm, I'm trying to get at the question of the breadth of your position. As I, as I understand it, you're now saying at war doesn't necessarily have to have a declared war. I, I think what we would say is at, uh, under the current version of the, the current wording of the statute implies that at war does require a declaration of war, but Congress has added an additional category when there has been an AUMF pursuant to the War Powers Resolution. So, so if the current version were, effect, were in effect in 1950, the Korean War would not be covered because there wasn't a declared war, and my understanding is there wasn't specific authorization for the use of force. That that would be my understanding as well. That con- Congress seems to have acted to extend the statute beyond declared wars, but not to anything that could be considered military operations if they have not been authorized in a particular manner. Mr. Stewart, before your time runs out, uh, what, what is the government's position on the, uh, on the point raised by uh, uh, counsel for respondent, namely, uh, if there is a uh, dismissal of, uh, on, on the merits of uh, a, a, uh, a civil action, uh, is the government uh, barred from uh, later bringing a different action on the same claim? Yes, we would think we would be barred. We, we think that was Congress's expectation in 1986, and that's the understanding of the statute that we've been operating under. That is, our protection under the statute is that when a KETAM suit is filed, we have an initial opportunity to decide whether to intervene or not. Even if we initially decide not to intervene, we can move later to intervene for good cause shown. And so if we initially think the relator can do a capable job, but then we decide later, no, he can't, our protection against the claim being badly litigated is that we can take over the suit. And if we don't avail ourselves of that protection and the case is decided against us on the merits, then claim preclusion would apply. And I think in in Taylor versus Sturgill, the Court identified a number of categories of cases in which non-parties can be barred in subsequent litigation. One of them is when a litigant allows his claim to be litigated by a representative. And the court in Stevens described 
key TAM suits as a species of representational standing. And I think the same principle would apply to a suit brought by a second relator as well. That is an additional category of non-party preclusion that the Court in Stevens — I mean, sorry, the Court in Taylor versus Sturgill identified was that when one party is barred from litigating himself, he can't relitigate the same claim through a proxy. And if the United States would be barred by the judgment in the first key TAM suit from filing its own suit, then to allow a second relator to go forward on the same claim would, in essence, be allowing the United States to relitigate through a proxy. And to us, it makes perfect sense that Congress drafted the first to file bar specifically with reference to pending actions. Because if, if the case is not the first case is not dismissed on the merits, uh, dismissed without prejudice and then Realtor 2 files, uh, your position is that, that suit may be maintained? It, it would not be — our position is it would not be barred by the first-to-file provision. Now, it, it, the Court may want to look at I'm, — I'm curious to know, it, 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 just because of background, would the first suit uh, told statute of limitations as to the second Realtor? I, I probably — we believe probably not. That is, I think typically the, the rule is that if the first suit is ultimately dismissed, then the second suit proceeds as though nothing had happened, but that, that time wouldn't be told. But, but the Court may look at page 5A of the brief, which uh, reproduces the current version of the public disclosure bar. And it says, this is about halfway down the page, the Court shall dismiss an action or claim under this section unless opposed by the government if substantially the same allegations or transactions as alleged in the action or claim were publicly disclosed in a federal criminal, civil, or administrative hearing in which the government or its agent is a party. So often the effect of the first suit may be to bar second relators from suing under the public disclosure bar unless they qualify as original sources. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Uh, Mr. Elwood, you have reserved four minutes. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Stewart said that uh, the only language in the provision in the Wartime Suspension Limitations Act which limited it to criminal, uh, to crim- to limited it to crimes, was the phrase now indictable, and I disagree with that. If you look at the Antitrust Suspension Act, which is reproduced in our brief, um, it, it said it, what the what Congress you said there was any violation. It's very telling that 47 days after enacting the Wartime Suspension of Limitations Act, which used offense, to apply only to crimes, it said any violation uh, which is now indictable or subject to a civil proceeding. So it was the word offense there that was limiting it to crimes, not uh, the word not now indictable. In addition, I want to be perfectly clear about this. And in page 5 of our reply brief in note 3, we go through all of the claimed criminal code provisions which supposedly use the word offense to mean a civil violation, and they do not. Every time the word offense appears, it is to describe the crime in the, uh, in the statute, not something else. They may say the conduct underlying the offense or something like that, but every time they use the word offense, it is to refer to a crime and nothing else. Um, uh, Mr. Stewart also mentioned this, the um, Hutto case, and so this was decided against the backdrop of Hutto. Uh, I want to point out that, that the crime at issue in Hutto is the last criminal code provision which they've identified, which used the word offense, they say, to uh, include a civil violation. And the government there said that that was taken care of. It's now uh, no longer a uh, — no longer applies to civil violations because they indi- — Congress amended 371, the conspiracy statute, to say that a minor offense is a misdemeanor. Well, that has exactly the same effect of the — statute that I talked about earlier that was enforced the day this provision of the Wartime Suspension Act was enacted that says that offenses are either felonies or misdemeanors. Nobody has said a word about that yet. And it has exactly the same provision as the, provi- uh, the amendment that Mr. Stewart says overruled Hutto. Also, I think Hutto has to be viewed in light of the case it cited, a five-page opinion that relied heavily on the 1893 case of Pettibone, which just said there can be conspiracies to violate the civilian laws. So I think Hutto is a conspiracy case and nothing more. Um, oh, and with respect to um, the, uh, the res judicata, I want to point out that at this point still no one has cited a case in which Relator 2 is bound by the loss of Relator 1. Uh, Taylor versus Sturgill talks about representative litigation, and I think that that maybe works in one direction, and that the government can be bound by Relator 1's loss. But it's hard to say that Relator 1, I mean, at least 
I will be more than happy to argue this position, but I can expect that there will be some pushback, uh, probably including from the government at that time, if I say that Relator 2 was the representative of Relator 1 when Relator 2 was a stranger to Relator 1. Relator 2 was treated as the government government for this purpose. But in any event, uh, no one has yet cited to me a case where this has already been determined, so it's all litigation risk to my client now. And finally, I want to point out one final thing, which is that uh, Mr. Stewart said that a undeclared war under the pre-amendment uh, wartime suspension act did not apply to undeclared wars. The Fourth Circuit said differently, and the government has now confessed error, or at least it said that the Fourth Circuit erred in that position. I just wanted to bring that to the Court's attention, even though it is at most a tertiary issue before this Court. And if there are no further questions, we'll rely on our submission. Thank you, Counsel. Case is submitted.